Welcome to UO Today. I'm Paul Pepys, Director of the Oregon Humanities Center. My guest today is Nathan Harris, author of the New York Times bestseller, The Sweetness of Water. The novel is the winner of the 2021 Ernest J. Gaines Award for Literary Excellence. It was long listed for the Man Booker Prize, the 2022 Carnegie Medal for Excellence, and the Center for Fiction's First Novel Prize. It was also named Best Book of the Year by Oprah Daily, NPR, The Washington Post, Time Magazine, the Boston Globe, Smithsonian Magazine, the Chicago Public Library, Book Browse, and The Oregonian, as well as the New York Times Book Review Editor's Choice. The Sweetness of Water was an Oprah's Book Club pick and one of President Obama's favorite books of 2021. Harris earned his BA in English from the University of Oregon in 2014. He was a recipient of the Creative Writing Program's Kid Prize. Harris earned an MFA from the Michener Center for Writers at the University of Texas in Austin. On February 16th, 2022, Harris will give a virtual reading as a guest of the University of Oregon's Creative Writing Program. Uh, thanks, Nathan, for coming on the show. It's great to have you. It's great to have you back, in a sense, at the University of Oregon. It's a pleasure to be here. Happy to talk with you. So first, um, tell you, you are an Oregonian. Tell us a little bit about your background. Absolutely. I was I was born in Eugene, actually. I only was there for a few years, though, and then uh, grew up in Ashland, Oregon. So, um, it, you know, whoever has been there, beautiful, beautiful little town, you know, idyllic. And I had I had a great upbringing there. And uh, I only, you know, I always planned to go to U of O. And I had a I had a wonderful time there. You know, I, I studied writing with uh, Jason Brown um, and learned a ton. And spent a year in San Francisco, and that's when I got into the Missioner Center, headed to Austin, and um, everything kind of just went from there. So um, many writers uh, who begin their careers, uh, who are fiction writers, begin with a short story collection, and and then there are writers. Jason Brown is one of them who, who tend to, to focus on the short story as, a, uh, as the genre of choice. But you left right into a, a, a major novel. What, why, why did you make that choice? I, you know, it's less of a choice and more of just what comes to you as, as a writer, what comes to your imagination. And I just, I had always had in my mind this story or the, the seeds of a story. I, I've always loved historical fiction, um, you know, going back to Gone with the Wind, you know, I've always enjoyed the sort of sweeping novels, you know, um, you know, Cold Mountain, Good Lord Bird, The Known World. And um, I just sort of saw a story that I hadn't seen told exactly. And I had always told myself, kind of coming from where you're coming from that, you know, this, is, this story is too big for you maybe do a short story collection, write something that's more about, you know, your upbringing. But I just decided to kind of dive into it. What's the worst that could happen? You know, that's what I thought. And um, especially the first novel, it's just, you're just by yourself. It's your own little world. And, um, you know, there's no judgment from, you know, readers. And I just said, let's just go with it. And I, I went with it. And here we are. Now, now we get to talk. And I have all this stuff going on with the book. <laughs> so it's great. So you want to give us a very quick overview of the setup of the novel just to orient us? Sure. Yeah, the novel follows um, two brothers um, recently freed after the Civil War. And um, they become close with um, a landowner named George Walker. They're sort of camping on his land, trying to decide what to do next with their lives. And George is originally from the North. So he hasn't earned slaves, um, although his father did. And uh, his, his son recently died in the war. So he sort of fills that spot um, in his heart, if you will, with um, these two brothers. And he starts a peanut farm sort of in his son's um, name. And they help him for a, a fair wage. And that relationship between George and Isabel, his wife, and the two brothers, and him treating them fairly will have significant repercussions on on the town. So well, that's all I can give you. Just yeah, that's very that's very helpful. Thank you. So, <laughs> as you've just made clear, you chose as the the novel's historical location the Reconstruction South. Can you tell us a little bit about why you you cited the book there in that place at that time? Multiple reasons. I mean, um, 
on just a story level, I mean, that that's where, that's where it came to me. You know, I, I had always, when I was reading the oral histories of, of slaves that had been um, put down and freed men, I mean, that was the spot where I was, I was thinking, I wonder what that was like. Um, and it was sort of, um, I guess, thrilling in a sense on a craft level to sort of embody their minds and sort of have that, um, that, that sense of what they must have been going through. Um, at the same time, it's, it's such a uh, tense period in history. And I think it sort of reflects in a sense, even what we're going through now, uh, you know, in terms of uh, you know, differences, in, you know, between the races, in terms of class, and just sort of this upheaval of, of how we um, view our nation and, and how we're all sort of engaging with one another. So there was some mirroring taking place there. And yeah, those are my reasons mostly. Did you do, I mean, you, you just implied you did, but do you want to say a little bit, did you, do you have to do research for the novel? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think so. I think you do have to do research, but you have to also give yourself space to just see where the story goes. And that's just, I think that's one of the most difficult parts of historical fiction is deciding where that line is. I, um, I often cite, and I, I believe it's not true having um, spoken to others who know Edward P. Jones, but the story goes that I read once that he, when writing The Known World, he spent, I think like a decade researching the book. And um, in order to write it, he just sat down one day and he threw it all away. And he just said, in order to write this, I need to just, I, I know what I know. And now I have to let the story just take place. And I kind of followed his lead there, whether it happened or not. And, you know, I just, I, I did the research I felt like I needed to do to get to the point where it all felt real. I felt like I could, you know, just um, have the confidence to um, follow whatever took place. Yeah. Well, you, you know, you, one of the great achievements of the novel and for an old guy like me, this is an especially astonishing achievement is how successfully you managed to make real this range of characters. And it's a wide range of characters, all very distinct characters and uh, all, um, you know, located differently on this sort of, um, spectrum of this society that you've uh, rendered. It's, it's an amazing accomplishment, especially for a writer uh, uh, in a first novel. It's, it's very impressive. Uh, my kudos to you for that. It's not a question, it's just a comment. But my next question has to do with the point you made about upheaval. Um, and clearly upheaval, there are, there are a number of upheavals in this novel. The most obvious one is the, the end of the Civil War, the loss of the South in the, in the Civil War. And it's, it obviously, uh, as you mentioned, it is, a, it is a novel that takes place during the Reconstruction period. But it also seems to me that Reconstruction isn't just the time in which the novel takes place. It seems, I think it's arguably also a theme in the novel. That is, it's a novel about Reconstruction, not simply the time of reconstruction, but about other kinds of reconstruction. Is that a just assessment on my part? <laughs> well, I, I, as the author, I hate to get too, too deep into themes. You know, I, I, don't, I don't think of it exactly in those terms, although I see where you're going with it. I mean, to me, writing the book and making sure that it had the impact that I believe it's having on readers was so much more about viewing that sense of upheaval on an emotional level in my characters, you know, um, whether that's George and Isabel grieving for their for their son or the the brothers, the freed brothers' sense of not knowing what's going to come next and the upheaval of their entire existence being based around being in bondage and being freed suddenly. Um, or these characters in the town who a lot of the time they have, you know, to terrible, terrible racist views on the world. But they, again, they're seeing their entire livelihood um, facing the sense of upheaval that you're talking about. So it was more about sort of locating that in every single um, person that it applied to and sort of um, bringing that out for the, the reader to reckon with. And I think from that, um, 
I've, I've heard so many different ideas of this of people and the themes coming from that I didn't even think of, but it's, that was what I wanted to have happen. It's making that discussion take place. So, yeah. Um, the novel, the, 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 you know, the majority of the first half of the novel is very much concerned with the relationship between men, mm. between George and the brothers. And there are a number of other men that are involved. But in the second half of the novel, it increasingly focuses on Isabel and on uh, these two other women in Isabel's life, Mildred, her close neighbor, and Clementine. Um, and, and this is another one of the great achievements of the novel is that your ability to uh, occupy the subjectivity of, of, of uh, characters who are very different than you, and in this regard, different in terms of their gender. Um, tell us a little bit about your, you know, your your interest in getting inside of the heads of these women, as well as getting inside of the heads of these men. Yeah, I, I, I almost think of it as a structural uh, sleight of hand almost. And it was something that I set myself to do because I think I knew from the beginning that was going to take place on some level. And, um, you know, I think historically these stories do tend to focus on the men. Um, but Isabel is always there sort of in, in George's shadow. And I think during the second half of the book, I wanted her to be centered more and these other women to be centered more. Um, in, in terms of doing it, again, it, it goes back to just um, being patient and learning about these characters and being patient, learning about um, psychologically what they're going through. Um, I always talk about in terms of Isabel that in a lot of ways she reminds me of my mom, you know, and she had a lot of upheaval in her life in the middle of, you know, divorce. She used to be an attorney, but she hadn't been for like 25 years. She uh, passed the bar a second time and she created this beautiful community of women around her who were also um, attorneys and they were all, they're all still very close. So in, in a little way, I see parts of my mom and Isabel and it's just, it's teasing these parts of real life and people that you know and people that you love and care about. And, um, just, I don't know, things blossom from there. So um, yeah, patience and just sort of um, finding finding those connections. You, you make it sound as if the, the, part of your patience is that you have to wait for the characters that you've created to tell you their own stories. Is that right? Does that make sense? Um, <laughs> in, in a sense, I feel like uh, I don't wanna give them too much power to, <laughs> to be sure. And I think that's um, such an important thing for young authors, including myself, to learn because um, you love your characters, you know, but the story comes first and sometimes awful things are going to happen to them. If I thought Isabel was, you know, exactly like my mom, I, she would have the most perfect, you know, <laughs> peaceful, peaceful story. I mean, so you, you have to be um, in service of the story first and foremost and have um, no mercy in one sense on your characters, even though you love them. So they, they come to you, but again, I think the, the story and what must take place is the priority. So uh, we've already mentioned that you uh, got your BA at the University of Oregon and you, were, you participated in the KID tutorial program and you got the prize for the KID tutorial program. You mentioned your mentor, Jason Brown, uh, a good friend. And in fact, we've got a couple of interviews that we've done with Jason. Um, first of all, tell us a little bit about the KID Tutorial Program for those of our viewers who don't know anything about it. It's a fascinating program and an important one. And you're going to be speaking with the current cohort of KID uh, students uh, when, you, when you come for your reading. Tell us a little bit about that program. Yeah, sure. The program is um, a small group of, of students who have applied for it. And um, you pretty much meet in groups of gosh, from what I recall, three to six fellow students and then a, a teaching instructor. And it's just um, a chance to have an intensive, um, an intensive look at your stories with other um, young writers who, who are as passionate as you are. And it, it seems pretty rare to me in um, an undergraduate program to have an opportunity to do that and so much attention from the instructors and your fellow students. Um, and it, it was weekly and yeah, again, I, and I think just putting in those hours 
not only in, into your own work from getting feedback, but into studying other students' work and, and building those connections and building that sort of critical eye for um, how stories are operating. I mean, that's, that's invaluable as a young author. So I'm really grateful I had the opportunity. Is there any particular lesson or lessons that you learned while you were at the University of Oregon as a writer that you'd like to share with us? Oh, um, <laughs> I, I don't know. I, I guess it's, um, again, being, in terms of the kid tutorial, being patient with your fellow writers. And, um, you know, again, sort of learning to balance, even as I view my own work, um, being too critical with um with new writing you know just having that opportunity to feel like you know you you, you leave that a uh, cauldron of criticism and you feel like this story is awful you know there's i should throw it away but then you come back with a new revised copy and people have more thoughts and it's just you know these stories take time criticism is good analysis is good and um, that yeah so the the kid tutorial was very very helpful with that so the sweetness of water as is clear from my introduction, has garnered uh, astonishing accolades. Um, what's that been like for you? I mean, here you are, you're the, you know, you're this guy from Oregon, you write your first novel and suddenly, you know, you're getting interviewed by Oprah and your, your book is on all these lists. What's that been like? It's surreal and, and truly bizarre. It's hard to explain to people because some things really don't change. I mean, I, I wake up and I, I write in the morning just as I did before The Sweetness of Water was ever written. I was just writing short stories at University of Oregon. You know, it is it is the same in a way, but at the same time, you have these strange um, <laughs> moments of being on TV or, meet, or meeting Oprah. And it just, they they come and they go and you're kind of like, well, that, that was odd. You know, uh, you get these emails of these accolades that you get, and you go, that's, that's crazy. And then all of a sudden you're back in your, your little world. Um, and, you know, you have to get back to the, the task at hand. You know, my, I try to just stay grounded in, in new fiction and stay grounded in um, reading great fiction and, and just um, in, in these, these plots that I love and the stories that I love and try not to let it get to me too much, but I'm, you know, forever grateful for every, every accolade and every opportunity I get to, um, you know, share the book with readers. Well, th those are well-earned accolades. You just mentioned that you, you, you know, you, you try to get back to reading the, the, the fiction that you love. Who are some of the authors that have in influenced you? Ooh, yeah. So, so many, um, I like to see Marilyn Robinson, uh, James McBride, uh, Colson Whitehead, again, Edward P. Jones, um, Ishiguro, I mean, Marines of the Day is one of my, my favorites. Um, there's so many, and for so many different reasons. I mean, James McBride, The Good Lord Bird, another great historical fiction uh, novel. You know, he has this lovely sense of humor. It's, it's hilarious, and I think every, Every good book has to have some humor too, even if it's subtle. Um, so I, all, you know, I, I love that. And then you know, Colson Whitehead, just the variety of books he can write. Same with Ishiguro. I mean, there's they all offer different things, and you know, I just I love taking what I can and all the inspiration that I can for for my own writing. You mentioned um, Whitehead and Ishiguro, and their uh, you might even say compulsion to write in different genres. Mm -hmm. Is that something that interests you? I mean, have you thought about writing a, a, a zombie novel or a, you know, a sci-fi novel or something like that? Maybe, maybe not a zombie novel. Um, absolutely. It's, um, you know, that's the next stage. And that's the sort of thing that, you know, gets me excited in the morning when I sit down at my, you know, at my computer is, what can I do? What risk can I take? Will it be a, a terrible failure? You know, will... I, I, I don't know. It's, it's, uh, I, I just need the time to explore those avenues and I certainly will, but um, you know, I'm sure there's going to be some dead ends that um, only I will know about, but <laughs> you know, time will tell. So um, are you willing to tell us what you're working on now? I'm working on another um, novel of historical fiction, sort of the same time period, but more 
more expansive in landscape. Um, some of it um, isn't set in the United States, for example. I'm not going to give you too much, but um, and and it's more of a almost more of an adventure novel. You know, I I wanted to write something almost um, unabashedly plot driven in a way. So I mean, there's 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 sinking boats and there's you know double crossings and all sorts of fun stuff like that. So I mean, I think I think people will get a kick out of it and. You know, it's it's a bit more um, lighthearted in nature. Um, the sweetness of water is very cinematic uh, on its own terms, and it would, uh, you know, I think it would translate very easily to the screen. Have you been approached about that? Is that something that you've been thinking about, or other people have been thinking about? I've taken a few meetings with a few a few different directors and a few writers, and um, it's it's currently getting pitched around. Um, nothing nothing concrete, but again, when you look back on some of the best you know movies and TV shows that have come from books, sometimes the books are you know years old, and it's you know it's such a, a slow, long, arduous process. I think it's it's a bit of a trap as a as the novelist to get caught up in the in the film side of things because you need the producer, you need the director. So I, I try not to think about it too much, but you know things are starting to build on that front, and um, I'm waiting myself to find out what will come of it. So you mentioned um, when we were speaking about Isabel, uh, uh, and you know you mentioned your your mother and building community, and you know one of the things that's fascinating about the book. It's a book about uh, the legacy of slavery, but it's really focuses on racial reconciliation more than on violence, though, you know, that, that, that's a reality that, that's alive in the book. But in particular, in the role that Isabel plays in this process of reconciliation, reconcil racial reconciliation, I'm thinking in particular about her relationship with Landry and also what, where, where she goes towards it, 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 at late in the novel. Say a little bit more about that, the importance of um, community and reconciliation in your view to the, to the themes of this novel. Hmm. Um, well, I, I think it's at the core on some level of Isabel and George's character that that's what they want. Um, I would almost pivot though and also speak to the naivete of both of them in their attempts to do that. Um, I, I, I don't want it to be overlooked. You know, George at his core, uh, he's a, he is charitable in his way, but he's also acting out of selfishness. You know, he's acting this way partially because his son was lost to him. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, and Isabel, you know, she, she wants sort of this, um, to, to follow George's legacy and have this return to normalcy and um, in a way. And I, so yeah, and it leads to a lot of consequences that are, um, you know, wide ranging for, again, the entire town. And I guess I just wrote it with an idea of wanting readers to, um, I don't know, reckon, reckon with both sides of that coin, you know, the, the threats of reconciliation, the dangers of it, but also, you know, acknowledging how important it is to to seek out. Yeah, that's really helpful. Thank you for for those words on that topic. Uh, I think related to you, you know, you you talk about this George's selfishness, and uh, to be sure, George is profoundly selfish in certain ways. Um, it's also seems to me that there are characters who are fixated in 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 certain ways or i don't know if i would use the word obsession though i might use the word obsession with george but fixation that is to say there there are these ideas or beliefs or um fantasies that some of the characters have that that have a kind of centrality for them uh, and in some cases i think that it can lead in positive ways and in, in negative ways. Say a little bit more about your sense of the human need for that kind of focus on something that is idealized beyond reality. Right, right. Um, I, I mean, I think for some of the characters, it's simply a necessity in order to keep going. I mean, when we talk about 
uh, Prentice, for example, or Landry wanting, you know, the little slice of safety, just a house of their own. Um, thinking about finding their mother and how to do that. And, you know, just having this certainty that she's out there somewhere. How do you, you know, as, um, again, as someone in bondage or someone who has nothing, how, you know, what do you have if not your dreams? Um, or if you're somebody who's, I mean, I don't know, again, if we go to the, the, some of the more villainous characters in the story, if you don't have your community that is built on this idea of, of owning slaves and the entire industry that you're family has built all these years um, built on the backs of others if that's gone what do you have so you dream of reclaiming that reality so um, I mean I just I think we all work that way in some way and I when in trying to drill into what is motivating these characters it was important to know their dreams and to know um, you know what they're fantasizing about in that way so that's what I was trying to get at I think Another uh, related aspect is the way in which you pluralize ideas of freedom. And it, you know, for me, this is really interesting because at this moment in our, our time, there's this kind of fetishizing of freedom in, a, in, in certain quarters that's very limited and constricting and a, a kind of domineering notion of what freedom means. The novel sort of each character conceives of this idea in a in a very different way, as if there isn't one thing that freedom is, that, that there are many freedoms. You want to say a little bit about your understanding of freedom for uh, as a as a topic in the book? Hmm. Um, I mean, again, again, I, I think we're getting at sort of these these uh, these grander ideas and I, I, I don't know. It's sort of like that idea of fantasy. I think I think it's closely related. I, I think in general, each person's idea of freedom and why it's so interesting is that it is going to be different in some sense from the next person. And that's why we can't really reach a consensus on what it is. Um, and so again, I just tried to um, find in each person what, what that idea would be and, and put that onto the page. So we're coming to the end of our time. I think this will be my last question. It's a question I ask most writers that I have the opportunity to interview. Have you read anything recently that you'd recommend? Sure, yeah. This recent memoir, Punch Me Up to the Gods by Brian Broom, um, struck me very hard and, and, and really moved me. It's about a young black man um, I believe he's in Pittsburgh and uh, you know, Brian Broom and he's riding a bus and he sees an, a young father with his son and he sort of um, has this flashback of his um, entire upbringing um, thinking about being a young uh, gay man growing up with a, a, a difficult father and um, a mother who was struggling and um, you know coming into his own and I, I, I bring it up, I guess, because it's, it's so different from what I write, but, um, you know, and I, I would be terribly afraid to ever write something like that, but um, it's one of those books that just shows that it, can, it doesn't have to be like the sort of stuff that someone writes, you can still take so much from it, and um, I certainly did, so that, it's a fantastic book, I would recommend it. Well, thank you, Nathan, for that recommendation. Thank you for taking the time uh, to speak with us. And thank you especially for this amazing book, The Sweetness of Water. Thank you so much. Be here. I've been speaking with writer Nathan Harris, author of The Sweetness of Water. On February 16th, 2022, he will give a virtual reading as a guest of the University of Oregon's Creative Writing Program. Thanks so much for watching.